This program is brought to you by the Stanford Humanities Center. For more information, please visit us at shc.stanford.edu. This is a program that we've been planning for a long time to go back 2,500 years in history. And uh, I'm Patty Lundberg. I'm Executive Director of Humanities West. This program is put on with the teamwork of the Board of Directors of Humanities West, all volunteers, and especially, as you'll see as we go on this evening and tomorrow, with the help of the Stanford Classics Department. Now, they are not our only sponsor for this evening. We've been exploring history and celebrating the arts for 31 years, and everybody in this room has been supporting Humanities West more or less over 31 years. Some of you have been here for 31 years, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart for supporting Humanities West. We're especially grateful to Bank of the West, which makes it possible for us to have a lot of students and high school and college teachers in the audience, thanks to Humanities West that provides our student participation project. And especially thanks to the Consulate General of Italy and the Italian Cultural Institute. Paolo Barlera is here from the Italian Cultural Institute. We had expected Mauro Batocchi, the, the Consul General of Italy in San Francisco, but he's been called to meet with the ambassador in Washington, so we're sorry he can't be here tonight. And we're having maybe more fun than he is. <laughs> We also thank the uh, Da Vinci Society and the California Classics Association, which has helped to sp both of which have helped to sponsor our program for this weekend. But without further ado, let's bring on Walter Scheidel, who's going to talk about the city-state republic empire. What was the Roman Republic really like? Uh, classicists ask a lot of questions, and this is the first for the night. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for this kind introduction, and thank you to all of you for coming out on this uh, special night. Now, my job is to tell you how ancient, what ancient Rome was really like. And of course, in a way, we all think we know about Roman civilization, uh, the monumental heritage that you can see if you visit the city of Rome, like the, uh, the Colosseum, or the, the culture of public bathing. You could, can't really tell this is a public bath, the baths of Caracalla, but literally thousands of people uh, could uh, bathe at the same time, hot and cold and uh, tepid and steaming, and in any kind of uh, varieties. Rome is also famous, uh, rightly so, for spreading its material culture, its civilization, uh, beyond the core all over Italy and the Mediterranean. Of course, it's best preserved in the city of Pompeii, which was was covered by the ashes of Mount Vesuvius in 79 AD. But there are Roman monuments, uh, evidence of Roman civilization farther afield. You have enormous aqueducts in places like France or Spain, and also in places that have become increasingly far to go to for us today. This is a Roman theater in uh, Leptis Magna in Tripolitania, close to the capital of Libya, not a major tourist destination right now or the Roman-era temple complex in Baalbek in Lebanon, very close to the Syrian border, which I luckily visited a number of years ago, or a place you really can't go to anymore, the city of Palmyra in an oasis in Syria, one of the most uh, extravagant uh, Roman cities in the East. Then there are other relics of Roman culture you can easily visit, like Hadrian's Wall. The only problem is it doesn't really look like this. This is the one day a year when it's not pouring uh, with <laughs> rain on like the other 364 days, as you can imagine. And then, of course, we can at least reconstruct what the center of Roman civilization used to look like. This is a famous model in a museum outside the city of Rome, a huge, almost like a theme park, a huge monumentalized uh, space representing what Edgar Allan Poe 
Paul called the grandeur that was Rome. Now, what all these images have in common is one thing. They have nothing to do with the Roman Republic, because all these developments happened later in the following centuries, in the first few centuries AD, when Rome had become a monarchy and the Republican system had already failed. It's actually very difficult to find uh, suitable visuals for that period. Now, what is remarkable, though, about uh, the Roman Republic is that it made all this possible by building up an enormous empire over hundreds of years, roughly in the second half of the first millennium BC. Now, this is a process not just rare or remarkable, but genuinely unique in world history. And it's unique for the very simple reason that prior to American independence, all large states in history used to be monarchies. And republics, in as much, in as, much as they existed at all, tended to be rather small. City-states or intermediate, medium-sized entities like Venice. Rome is really the only republic in history that got to be really, really, really big. Now, why is this so rare? It's rare because once you go beyond the monarchy, it's difficult to scale up. If you want to have an element of popular participation in politics, in public discourse, how do you make this happen? One solution is a system of representative government, which of course the US uh, found uh, early on, luckily, but the Romans weren't very interested in that. They were more interested in direct democracy. And of course, direct democracy, where the people have to come together to deliberate, to make uh, decisions, well, that's very difficult to do on a large scale. You can do it in a single spot. You can do it in a Swiss canton, uh, to, to name the most recent example. Once you have a very large area, this is hard to do especially in a pre-modern environment where you have inadequate infrastructure, no communications technology, high rates of illiteracy, and so on. And yet, this is exactly what the Romans tried to do and did very successfully for hundreds of years. Now, in so doing, they created all kinds of interesting tensions between this increase in scale and the fact that republican institutions remained broadly unchanged over time. And those are the tensions that I want to talk about in the next half hour or so that propelled Roman development forward, but ultimately also undermined the imperial project and the republic as such. Now, I've now several times used words like big and large, which don't really know, mean very much uh, unless you put them in context. This is the Roman Empire at its peak, and all the yellow bits uh, of this empire uh, were already in Roman procession by the end of the Republic. So most of the empire had been built up in the Republican period. Now, again, you have to be sort of familiar with the geography of Western Eurasia to appreciate what this really means. So to simplify matters, I uh, put up two maps that are drawn on exactly the same scale. And you can see that already by the end of the Republic, the Roman Empire is as wide east-west as the entire continental United States. And that's very large by any reasonable historical or global standard. What's even more remarkable is that all this happens from very, very small beginnings, because in the middle of the first millennium BC, Rome starts out as a single city-state on the river Tiber in western central Italy. And this map tells you even less, because you have to be intimately familiar with the geography of the Italian peninsula to make much sense of this. So once again, I need to put this in context. Again, you have two maps drawn on the same scale. You can't quite see this, but on the right-hand side, you have Santa Clara County. <laughs> so you can see that 2,500 years ago, the territory of Rome was roughly that of Santa Clara County, which you could probably walk, at, which there wasn't so much traffic, you could probably walk across in a day or two. Um, the population of Rome at the time is probably uh, that of Palo Alto, where I live, about 60,000 people. And so what the Romans did over the next 500 years, they would go out from this tiny spot the size of a single county and conquer a territory the size of the entire continental United States with the population twice that of the state of California today, which at the time was about a quarter of all people who lived on Earth because there weren't all that many people to begin with. Now, this is obviously something rather uh, remarkable, um, which I, shall, I hope this is moving. You can see uh, the, the unstoppable progress 
years of Roman uh, expansion under the, the Republic. And this is something that raises all kinds of questions. But how is this really possible if you start at really tiny? How do you end up this uh, big? Well, part of the answer is probably the Roman um, political system. Because when we talk about the Republic, we are not talking about the entire empire, this growing red blob that I just showed you on the map. The Republic really only consists of Roman citizens, people who have Roman citizenship. It doesn't include foreigners or slaves or provincial subjects or any other number of people under Roman control. Now, ignore the detail. I had to put up something, right? I can't just talk, so I had to put up uh, a picture. This is a very simplified version of the Roman Constitution. The take-home lesson is the Roman Republican system, which remains largely unchanged for hundreds of years, consists of three main elements. The people, by which I mean the people who really matter in a political sense, i.e. adult male citizens. Women are excluded from the process, but that's the same in Western countries uh, well into the early 20th century, so that's not at all unusual. In order to participate in the republic in a political sense, the people, those adult male citizens, had to physically come together in the city of Rome in designated meeting spaces to meet and listen and deliver and elect officials, pass legislation, decide about war and peace, conclude treaties, that kind of thing. There are different types of assemblies uh, in which people met. The two main ones are organized in different ways. One is uh, one where people are classified, they are put in different voting groups according to what we would call uh, people's net worth. So how much money you have decides which of these groups uh, you are placed into. There's a very large number of voting groups for what we would call the upper class or the upper, upper middle class, and there is a smaller number of voting groups for everybody else, i.e. the majority of the population. Again, it's something you have in the 19th century in many Western countries still. So even though the system is overtly democratic, it is at the same time heavily biased in favor of the wealthy, the conservative element of Roman society. Then there's another assembly where the same people come together, but they are organized in a superficially more modern looking way, according to, to geographical voting districts, of which there are ultimately 35 in uh, Rome and Italy, four in the city of Rome, and most of them elsewhere, all over the Italian peninsula. And each district has one vote, and the majority wins and carries the day. Now this sounds great on paper, but in order to cast your vote, members of these various districts had to show up in the city of Rome on the designated day and cast their votes. And of course, the average peasant couldn't really afford to walk to Rome or ride on their donkey for I don't know how many days uh, just in order to participate in these assemblies. And so it was mostly rich people who could afford to do so. So once again, you have a bias in favor of the rich and powerful, which the Romans thought was just fine because it makes perfect sense. The more you have, the higher your stake is in the community, the more weight your vote should carry. An idea that Plato, of course, next door in Greece, was also quite fond of. The the second element is that, uh, so you have the democratic features, people casting votes in a, like I said, rather uh, modern looking way, but the whole system is rigged in a way in, the, in favor of the wealthier element. Uh, the second uh, key part of the system are the officials. People are elected by these assemblies to serve as generals or exercise other governmental functions. They usually serve for one year, they step down, they can be held accountable. All of this sounds great. But if you look at this more closely, you find that over hundreds of years, most of these officials are drawn from just a few dozen families or clusters of families, clans or lineages. So there's a very strong oligarchic element um, to all of this. If you think the Kennedys or the Bushes or the Clintons are bad, you should really try the Roman Republic. The most successful families last for hundreds of years, and every generation they get members of these families elected to the high office, and of course that's a self-reinforcing effect.
Now, to reinforce this oligarchic flavor of the Roman system, you also have the Senate. The Senate is nothing like our Senate. It doesn't really represent the people. It's essentially a club of formally elected officials. When they step down, they join the Senate. There are hundreds of them clumped together in this club, collectively representing the richest and most powerful people in Roman society, exercising a huge amount of informal authority, social control, and so on. Now imagine if you're a Roman official, you belong to these high up families, you elected just for one year, and you know that at the end of the year, you rejoin this club, where are your loyalties going to lie? Are they going to lie with the people who elected you for one year, or with the peers whom you have to face for life once you step down? So there's a great deal of social control uh, exercised through uh, peer pressure, if you will. The result of this is that the Roman Republic is very, very heavily shaped by oligarchic uh, practice. When people run for office, more often than not, they don't necessarily talk so much about what they have accomplished. They talk about the accomplishments of their own ancestors, what their fathers and great grandfathers and great grandfathers had done for uh, the Republic. They identify themselves in family terms. So if you were just a little bit cynical, you could say it's a system a little bit like a mafia system we have a number of very powerful families, all intertwined by marriage and adoption and, and uh, all kinds of connections running the show from behind the scenes. And it's maybe not entirely coincidental that some busts of Roman aristocrats like the charming guy uh, to the left bear more than a passing resemblance to modern day mafiosi, just like this guy, uh, just being apprehended by the carabinieri. But this is, of course, not the whole story. It's a very big part of the story, but it's not uh, the whole story because it is not a pure oligarchy. Pure oligarchies don't work very well because if you leave aristocrats to their own devices, they start fighting amongst each other on how to uh, carve up uh, the loot, how to control the state. If you look at late medieval Italy, you have many examples of this. The system here is stabilized by popular participation. People's, the assembly's participation input is vital in making sure that this kind of competition is contained and managed. As the second century BC Greek observer Polybius observed he was a hostage who was brought to Rome from Greece and then cozied up to the Roman elite and spent the rest of his life there. He observed that in Rome, the people, the people who gather in assemblies, are the only source of um, honor and punishment. They are the ones who decide it's going to be aristocrat A rather than aristocrat B who is going to hold that particular office next year. And as long as the aristocracy um, abides by these rules, the system functions and is stable, and it indeed was for hundreds of years. This means that no matter how oligarchic the system is, no matter how rich and powerful you are, no matter how old your family is, you have to physically face the people. This is how you would have faced them, just I face you on a raised uh, platform, uh, facing not an empty space as in this computer simulation of the Roman Forum, but a few thousand people whom you address in order to convince them to elect you. That has all kinds of interesting side effects, uh, one of which is that in this environment, you really need to develop develop skills, a culture of political rhetoric, a way of engaging the people and persuading them. And that's something that my colleague, uh, Professor Christopher Krebs, is going to talk about in his own lecture tomorrow morning. Now, this is in a nutshell the, Ro the Republic that managed to create uh, this enormous polity over time, but I haven't yet told you how the Romans went about um, doing this, because this is something not very likely to happen, as I said earlier. Now, it doesn't require an enormous amount of imagination to figure out that you can't go from very small to very large unless you are inordinately committed to military activity. You have to be really willing to engage in never-ending, open-ended warfare for generations ultimately for hundreds of years. And that's a very big part of the answer. It's not the only answer, but it's a key element thereof. This is one of our trusty British legionary war reenactors. Most of the Roman soldier reenactors seem to come from Britain uh, for some reason. Uh, Romans are really good at fighting. Uh, Romans are really good at drafting young men. They catch them at the right time in their late teens, early 20s, before they get married, before their fathers die, and they can take over their parents' farm when they are available 
available and aggressive uh, for a few years. They are drafted into these militia armies and sent out to fight. This is one of my favorite slides. Uh, it classifies 228 years of Roman Republican history according to whether we know the Republic was at war or not. And in all the red years, the sources tell us the Romans were fighting one or more enemies outside their borders. Now the blue years, which are far in between, are not necessarily years of peace. It's just the years where the sources don't tell us that there was a war going on. <laughs> of course, the you know, ancient sources are not that great, so it may well be that this overstates the actual incidents of Rome. Roman peacefulness. What we do know is that in 157 BC, after two and a half generations of continuous warfare, there was suddenly a lull. The Romans had crushed everybody else, they had defeated all their opponents, and they woke up one morning and there was no war going on. And the historian Livy tells us the Senate had a meeting because they were concerned that the Roman people might go soft in the absence of military challenges. And sure enough, they found an excuse to have another war. And the whole system uh, continued like this. Now, how do you justify this within your own society? We know this very well because the Roman sources talk about it at great length. It's either self-defense. Romans are really nice guys. There are all these bad people out there who want to do harm to the Romans, and you can't really allow this to happen. So ideally, you attack them proactively uh, to keep this uh, from unfolding. Or if you run out of credible enemies nearby, well, there is always someone somewhere else in the world who is at war with someone else, and you can intervene in that process. You can take sides. You can declare one of these belligerent parties to be your friend, your ally, and it allows you to get involved and in the process extend your sphere of influence. Now, for some reason, this is actually quite um, uh, poignant. Uh, the left-hand slide disappeared. It would have shown the tiny little city-state of Rome, so it doesn't really matter that the slide disappeared because you can see the end result. And the end result is what Cicero, near the end of the Republic, commented on, seemingly without much of a sense of irony, that the Romans had managed to conquer the entire known world by defending their allies which I should say is not just a Roman sentiment. We also find it in the late 19th century uh, when Brits discovered, they got up one morning, they had their morning tea, they read the Times, and they discovered they were in charge of one quarter of the entire planet. And they had no intention of doing this. It just sort of happened uh, by coincidence in a fit of absence of mind. So this kind of rhetoric <laughs> is quite pervasive. It's not limited to Roman history. Now, I was told by Patty Lundberg not to put too much text on any slide. So this is the only slide that has a lot of text. But it's actually quite easy to see what's going on here. There is one nation which at its own cost, you know, goes to war on behalf of the liberty of others. World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Panama, Afghanistan, you're right. You name it, you get the picture. The stamp out tyranny, injustice, it has a mission. It wants to um, fight for people's dignity, freedom, all these things. So if you look at this, this is an entirely unexceptional text. Except it is not a single text. It's two different texts separated by 2,000 years. The first half in red was written by the Roman historian Livy, looking back at the history of the Roman Republic, explaining to his readership how the Roman Empire got to be as big as it was in his own day by defending others. It's only the second half that's the State of the Union Address of 2004. The point is not at all, I should stress, that uh, the Roman Republic was like the US or vice versa because there are many, many differences and I'll come back to this at the very end. The point is, if you just stick to this kind of rhetoric, if you stick to the sources we have, the texts, you're not going to get very far because you're going to be ensnared in this kind of rhetoric. In order to figure out what the Roman Republic was really like, you have to penetrate the smokescreen, you have to go deeper and look at structure structural causes, and a rather different picture emerges. Does anybody recognize this gentleman? <laughs> Apparently you do. I hope you didn't invest with him. Uh, this is Bernie Madoff, the modern face of what is known as a pyramid scheme. And of course, you all know how a pyramid scheme works. The Romans were operating their own version of a pyramid scheme which in short is like this. The Romans go, they attack their neighbors, they hit them over the head, they take away their stuff. 
The next day they come back and they say, yeah, okay, we, we hit you over the head, we took away your stuff, but now we can all be friends and allies and we join together and what we're going to do is we'll attack your neighbors and we hit them over the head and take away their stuff. And then they go, they do it, and then they tell them, you know, we can be friends and so on. So you get the picture. If you do this for hundreds of years consistently, you can end up with a very, very large empire from very small uh, beginnings. What you're going to create in the process, though, is a state whose institutions are very much based on warfare. If you take warfare out of the equation, there isn't all that much left. And that's certainly true of the Roman Republic beyond the city of Rome and its immediate hinterland itself. What you end up with is something that the famous uh, economist Joseph Schumpeter almost 100 years ago called objectless imperialism, which seems very paradoxical. Objectless imperialism is not that people get up in the morning and say, Let's go to war for no good reason. This is not how things work. There's always an elaborate ideological superstructure, self-defense, glory, defense of allies, the gods want us to, any number of things. But underneath, there is a structural need for never-ending warfare. Because if you stop, and this is a classic feature of a pyramid scheme, the whole thing will unravel. If you take this ongoing mobilization of huge numbers of young men out of it, there isn't much left of of the Roman state. And of course, you create a leadership whose career prospects depend largely on uh, the exercise of military command of distinguishing themselves in that sphere. And we can test this hypothesis by looking at the ancient sources. There are many wars where the Romans are really attacked by dangerous people. There are other wars where they have lucrative targets, where there's a lot of money to be made by fighting others. But eventually, there are also wars that don't make a whole lot of sense, where the Romans fight poor people where there isn't really much to be had, and they fight those wars anyway, which is a, a classic illustration of this principle. War has to keep on going almost indefinitely to keep the whole system working. Now, you can imagine that the kind of system that is set up like this entails a great deal of violence and human suffering, most notably, perhaps, the fact that the Roman Republic of hundreds of years manages to set up what is arguably the largest system of chattel slavery in world history, in terms of numbers, in terms of duration, larger than the slave systems of the Old South, the Caribbean, Brazil, other colonial systems. Literally millions of people are enslaved by Roman armies or others and sold off on Roman slave markets. Now, this is obviously a very bad thing, but once again, there is a hybrid outcome because there are unexpected benefits to this. The more slaves there are, the more, in a way, the people who are not slaves, the free Roman citizens tend to benefit. The more slavish slaves are, the worse you treat the slaves, the better you are going to treat the free. If it's customary to beat slaves, it will become unacceptable to beat free people because there has to be a clear distinction between free and slave. So society becomes more polarized um, over time. The slaves may well suffer, but the free, the citizens, benefit because their status, their citizen rights, their protections are actually reinforced, which is something you also find, for instance, in the Old South prior to the Civil War. And at the same time, to mitigate the system, it's not that difficult in Roman society to cross that divide. It's easy for free non-Romans to be enslaved, but it's also relatively easy for some groups of Roman slaves to be manumitted, and when they are freed, they are fully incorporated into Roman society. They usually become Roman citizens. They join the Republic. They become part of it. This is, I don't have to emphasize, dramatically different from what happens in uh, the post-slave period in this country or in other parts of the Western Hemisphere. The key word here is integration. The Roman Republic, throughout its existence, is extremely good at incorporating people who used to be neighbors, enemies, slaves, subjects, whatever, and turn them into elements of the Republic. That said, there is, of course, an enormous uh, amount of cruelty uh, involved in this process. And I think if you give a talk that claims to explain what the Roman Republic was 
really like, you have to spend one minute uh, on this issue because otherwise we can't really do justice to the historical record. Romans are very good at crucifying people. It's not just Jesus Christ. Uh, we have stories that after the Spartacus slave uprising, 6,000 surviving rebellious slaves were uh, crucified. And of course, there are very few depictions, previously old Christian. And of course, you have the enslavement of millions of people. And we read about this in ancient sources and we say, okay, we know this happened and now let's move on to Cicero and Roman art and religion and architecture and admire all these wonderful things and we'll do this, I promise, uh, tomorrow. But it's worth considering what this would have been like, which is very difficult for us to understand. Unfortunately, right now, it's a little less difficult for us to understand. If you go to Syria or Iraq, you can see what crucifixions really look like. You can see what it looks like when women are sold into slavery by gangs of armed men. This is what the Roman Republic does for hundreds and hundreds of years. The only difference is that we have the Roman side of the story in the Roman case, and we have the anti-Islamic state side mostly uh, in the other case today. Which is not to say the Roman Republic is like ISIS, needless to say. There are many differences, but there are also structural similarities worth considering. And no, bad, uh, no matter how bad Islamic state is, they haven't yet begun to throw people to the lions, which the Romans did on a rather uh, impressive scale. That said, violence was of course only part of the explanation. You cannot build up an enormous empire almost from scratch just by being nasty and by fighting other people. The equivalent, as I said, would be all the 60,000 people in Palo Alto getting into their BMWs and their Teslas and going out and over the next 500 years conquering the entire United States. That's not a likely outcome, to put it mildly. And not just because people in other states are better armed than the people of Palo Alto, <laughs> that would probably be a, a rather in, important element uh, of the story. You have to be able uh, to incorporate, to co-op, to persuade other people that it makes sense to join the Roman side. And this is what the Romans do very successfully in the fourth, third centuries in particular, as they spread out uh, over Italy. What they do is they enfranchise some of their former enemies. They turn them into Roman citizens. They become purple or brown in this map. Uh, eventually, uh, millions of people in central Italy are technically Romans. They may live far away from the city of Rome, they may not even know any Latin, but they are technically Romans. And then the yellow guys to the north and the south, they are allies. They retain their own government, but they are tied to the Roman Republic because they owe it military support. In this way, the Romans are able uh, to mobilize ever larger militia armies. There are complementary strategies. One is settlement. Uh, the Romans found lots and lots of colonies. Now, colonies are not like modern colonies, which the Romans would have called overseas provinces. A Roman colony or colonia is a settlement that consists of Roman citizens and allies who are sent out to found a settlement in some place that had just been taken over by the Romans where the original inhabitants had been killed or displaced or enslaved to found a fortified uh, city. And if you do this long enough, you end up with a huge network of these colonies all over Italy which Livy called the bastions of empire. These are places inhabited by people who are super committed to the success of the Roman state. Why? Because the land they sit on, they know has been taken away from other people. They are surrounded by other people who don't like them. They know if Rome goes down, they are going to go down with it. I'm going to refrain from invoking analogies to modern settler populations that have an influence on the political process, but it's certainly a potent force in the Republic. Another strategy was logistical um, in nature. The Romans are great road builders. They build roads durable than the freeways we are forced to use uh, in the Bay Area because they are still around 2,300 years later. They don't have huge potholes. You can still, in some cases, uh, almost use them. Again, it takes hundreds of years, great tenacity, but eventually they create this enormous road network all over Italy and eventually the entire Mediterranean, physically tying all these thousands of local communities together. Now, before you think that I'm a hopeless materialist, which I am, but you shouldn't really think that, I should say there are other factors that also matter a lot, especially in the sphere of beliefs, of religion. 
Both Romans and foreign observers agree that the Roman Republic was so successful because the Romans are really pious. They have figured out the right way of engaging with supernatural powers. They use religion, they instrumentalize it to create cohesion, trust within the Roman citizenry. Now this is something uh, that Dr. Daniel Padilla is going to talk about in his lecture tomorrow, so I'm not going to belabor this point. What you're going to end up with is this agglomerate uh, of millions of Roman citizens and their allies whom you can rely on to raise huge armies numbering in five or even six figures. What's important here is that there are no other states in Western Eurasia that are organized in a similar way. All the other states out there are either kingdoms that rely more on mercenary armies or tribes and chiefdoms that are also warlike, but they're not as big and not as well organized. So that gives the Romans a huge leg up. It makes it very easy for the Romans uh, to make this quantum leap from Italy uh, all over the Mediterranean, crushing resistance wherever they show up. Um, this also incidentally means the end of the pyramid scheme because once the Romans step beyond Italy proper, they stop turning these new people into citizens or allies. They just defeat them in war and make them tax paying provincial subjects. And this is how the pyramid as such survives. So the pyramid scheme is actually quite successful in the long term. Now this means that there's a growing inflow of wealth, of plunder, of uh, tribute, of rent, of extorted money flowing from all these growing provinces into Italy and especially to the city of Rome, creating enormous benefits for people in the center. What also happens though in Italy itself, if you turn millions of people into Roman citizens, well, most of them will end up being nowhere near the city of Rome itself. It will become more and more difficult for them to participate in any meaningful way, politically, socially, religiously, in the Republic, in uh, the civic sphere. Now, if you look at the fourth century BC, at the start of Roman expansion, Pretty much everybody who was a Roman citizen lived in or near the city of Rome. And then as more and more citizens were created all over Italy, a growing majority of these citizens came to be farther away. By the end of the Republic, only one citizen out of five lives in or near the city of Rome. The other 80% are elsewhere in Italy or even in the provinces, which means they are really effectively disenfranchised. They can't participate in the, proce in the process. What's also striking is that the meeting places that the Romans had been using for hundreds of years are not really big enough to accommodate anything like those crowds. This is the Roman Forum, one of the traditional meeting spaces, and even before it was built up, you couldn't really cram more than a few thousand people into this space to attend certain assembly meetings, and yet there are now hundreds of thousands or millions of people who are entitled to the vote. So there's a huge mismatch between the size of the electorate and their actual engagement in the political process. By the late Republic, only a few percent of all people who were technically Roman citizens would have been even in theory able to fit into those meeting spaces that were provided in the city of Rome. And yet the ancient sources never complain about this. Nobody seems to think this is a problem. Romans are quite happy to have a tiny sliver of the electorate make all these decisions in the center itself. So it's a very imperfect perfect Republican system. Next time you hear about low voter, voter participation in this country, remember uh, the Roman Republic, where the problem is an entire order of magnitude worse than it is in the US today. The result of this is a growing bifurcation of Roman society. In order to uh, participate in the benefits of empire, you really have to be in Rome, because this is where everything happens, where all the money shows up. And of course, the officials who are elected by people who show up in Rome are going to cater to that particular constituency, which makes perfect sense. And so you have lavish investment in and around Rome in physical infrastructure. You get aqueducts that bring in fresh water from the mountains for the growing population. You have a sewer system. You have entertainment 
entertainment, you have spectacles, chariot races, theater performances, paid for by the aristocrats, by the state. You have the notorious practice of gladiatorial combat, which is uh, sponsored by candidates who run for political office. And eventually, by the end of the Republic, you even have subsidized and then free grain for citizens who live in the city of Rome. If you're a citizen, you live in the city of Rome, you're so special, you deserve grain to be given to you for free. Grain that's shipped in from the provinces, from Sicily, Sardinia, Africa, and other places. But you have to be in Rome in order to draw these benefits. Well, if you belong to the other 80% of Roman citizens who do not live in or near Rome, how are you going to get your slice of the pie? There are two options. A, you pack up and you move to the city of Rome, right? Lots of people do this. This is how Rome gets to be the largest city in European history prior to London in 1800 with about a million people. But there are limits to how many people can actually physically relocate to Rome itself. If you stay out there in Italy, what you want is land, a redistribution of land, a larger plot, a better life for your family, for your children, and so on. But it's very hard to accomplish. The main way out is to go and do what Romans had been doing for hundreds of years. If they wanted something, you join the military. And of course, there are still wars going on. There are now wars far away from Italy and Spain and Gaul and Turkey and North Africa and all kinds of increasingly exotic places, but they are still ongoing. Now, what happens, though, is if you have these big wars really far away from Rome and Italy, you can't really have a militia system anymore. You can't have soldiers shuttle back and forth between their family farms and the military. They have to be deployed in these theaters for years at a time. And so you have an increasing professionalization of the military, people serving for 10 or 20 years of their entire adult life in some cases. You also can't have elected officials who only serve for one year because they would spend most of that year just getting to where the war is happening and then getting back to Rome. So you end up with commanders who serve for years together with troops who also serve for years. And as a result of this, you have increasingly close ties between those commanders and their troops and correspondingly weaker ties between them and the center in the city of Rome, the assemblies and the political institutions. Now that's a rather risky situation because if that is not properly managed, you get increasingly autonomous military leadership that starts treating its military assets as almost private armies that can be used in political competition. And and in a way, it was probably impossible to manage this properly, to avoid this particular outcome, which ultimately leads to warlordism, that some of these commandos morph into warlords who use their, their armies in order to fight it out in the political arena. This is the context for what goes on in Rome in the first century BC. All these warlord-like figures, Marius and Sulla and Pompey and Crassus and Caesar, and all these larger-than-life figures you read about in the ancient sources and modern scholarship, Mark Antony, Octavian, uh, Lepidus, forming coalitions, fighting each other, uh, and an ongoing uh, series of ever bloodier, uh, ever more extravagant civil wars that destabilize the Republic system. And that's even before you introduce characters uh, like Cleopatra. So this is a very uh, colorful mix. And it's very easy to become mesmerized by this colorful mix and focus on these, as I said, larger than life personalities. But those personalities wouldn't have gotten very far in the absence of the structural changes, the increasing autonomy of the military sphere that made all these conflicts, all these uh, colorful biographies uh, possible. So again, if you want to understand what really happened and why it did, we have to dig uh, deeper. What we do know is the ultimate outcome. The ultimate outcome is that the Republican institutions do not survive these tensions created ultimately by the inordinate growth of the empire uh, generated by the Republic. What you end up with is a monarchy that has many trappings of a military dictatorship, which in the West lasts for 500 years, in the East, in Constantinople, 1500 years, up to 1453, when the Turks uh, take Constantinople. 
people. That's a very stable, but also a very traditional system of government. It makes the Roman Empire less special. It is now like all the other big empires in world history, in China and India and the Assyrians and so on and so forth. It is effectively the end of Roman Republican exceptionalism. And I use the word exceptionalism advisedly because this is one of the reasons why the history of the Roman Republic, even more than 2,000 years later, is arguably of relevance to us today. It is not because the US or any other country in the world is like the Roman Republic. That's not a very meaningful statement. About 10 years ago, there was a whole slew of books being written in response to Afghanistan and uh, Iraq, likening the US to the Roman Empire. The themes were uh, imperial overstretch, decline, uh, that kind of thing. It got so bad uh, that a friend of mine, Václav Smil, sat down and wrote a whole book, Why America is Not uh, a New Rome. And he makes a very compelling case because they're really, in many ways, are dramatically different. And yet, there are similarities. Similarities lie in the fact that 2,000, 2,500 years ago, the Romans had to figure out a way of maintaining a functioning republic with popular participation and managed political uh, competition amongst its elite while it was growing inordinately in size, incorporating more and more people from the outside and establishing an empire beyond the republic proper. This is not entirely dissimilar to the situation that the United States has found itself in for a number of generations now. Enormous growth, enormous uh, levels of integration from very small beginnings, and the extensions, if not of imperial, then at least of hegemonic power on a global scale. And the question remains how under these conditions you can maintain a functioning republic. In that respect, uh, the legacy of the Roman Republic is still very much with us. And with that, I've used up my 42 minutes, and all that's left to me is to thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much. This program is brought to you by the Stanford Humanities Center. For more information, please visit us at shc.stanford.edu.